this is Deb Carson from Fox Sports Radio, and you're listening to Jim and Florence on the Forum. This is James Patrick, and I am so excited to be talking to our next guest. And I, we send our deepest condolences to our friend uh, J.L. Rostein, Jen, who lost her mom today. And we're just sending out huge prayers to her. So we're dedicating this show to her. And also to Florence, Florence had an emergency, nothing dire. So no, you know, no craziness to her. She'll be okay. But it's just something she had to do. And she was very much looking forward to, to introducing it to talking to our next guest, who is one of the most fascinating people you will ever want to talk about. His career is amazing. He's done a little bit of everything. Talk about a powerful with him and his great wife, Linda. Boy, I'm telling you, they, they were as powerful as it gets. And it's amazing that he's able to share all his experiences. But I'd really like to introduce producer, executive producer, TV icon, and political icon as well, the great Harry Thomason. How are you, Harry? Well, I don't know if I can live up to that reputation. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'll try. laughs> uh, well, I think you have. I've been uh, studying you and researching you, and boy, you've done a little bit of everything. Why don't you discuss first about your television career and where you kind of, some of the shows that you did were some of the big hit shows. One of my one of my, uh, my, a couple of my mom's favorites, obviously Designing Women and some of the other ones, and also The Blue and the Gray, which was a huge series that my mom loved too. So, but boy, Designing Women, Emerald, Evening Shade, Hearts of Fire, Fall Guy, which is another one of my favorites, and Women of the House. Those are some of your television credits. Boy, that is amazing career. How did it all start? Well, it all started that I was a high school football coach and history teacher in Little Rock. <clears throat> and uh, we were all leaving. The coach, the head coach was going on and I had a chance to to go to college as, a, as an intern and, and as a coach while working on my graduate degree. I decided I'd always been interested in photography. And when I was 13, my mom had given me for Christmas a dark room and so I'd always been interested and so I decided well if I'm ever going to try photography in the film business it's now and so I saw in the newspaper about a guy that had just announced he was running for governor and it listed the ad agency and it was we were it was in the spring and we had just finished track practice and I told the other coaches I'm gonna go down and talk to this guy you know mm -hmm. So the next day I did, and I'd drawn up some pretty fair storyboards, actually, and took them down. I said, I, and I told, told his secretary what I wanted, and I heard her go in and shut the door, and then I heard them get into an argument, and finally she came out and said, well, he didn't want to see you, but I'm going to make him see you. You've got 10 minutes. And so I went in, and I laid out the stuff. And he said, why in the world would I hire a football coach to do a political commercial on a guy that's spending big money to get elected governor? And I said, I'd talk to my uncle, who was a rather wealthy man, and, and I said, I can't do this, but would you pay for him in case they refuse to pay when I'm finished? And he thought that was a good idea. <laughs> and, he, and so I told the guy, well, here's the reason you should do it because I'll do the first commercial here, and if you don't like them, you walk away, you don't pay a thing. And he said, well, only a fool would turn down that deal. And he said, you've got him. It, now, it's Thursday afternoon. He said, you've got him. You've got him for four hours, Saturday morning, beginning at 7 a.m. You know? mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, we'll be there. So I went back, told the other coaches, and I said, guess what, guys, you're going to be a film crew this weekend. And I went over everything what they would do and so forth. And we needed to bring in a couple of our high school athletes as grips and so forth. And I did that. And that night we went down to the film place that processed all our football films, you know, our game films. And they loaned us a camera, showed us how to operate it, showed us how to load it, which was the toughest thing. And mm -hmm. then Friday night we went back to my house. We rehearsed what each one would say and do. And Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, we were there, and we were on this beautiful ranch, with, took it back, and the guy says, okay, I'm going to hire you to do the rest of them. And wow. So, I couldn't tell him that my coaching staff was the crew, but so it, it took a week or two to get a real crew and so forth, But and that's how I got in the film business. How I got out here was a story in itself, you know, how I ended up in Hollywood, you know. Mm-hmm because now, of a random phone call. What was that about? Oh, well, 
<clears throat> I was doing commercials in Little Rock and films, you know, and that's what we called industrial films at the time, but what mm-hmm. are, you know, films on every back from certain builders to apartment, how, you name it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I read a story in Reader's Digest, and it was about this guy in uh, New Mexico who was an Olympic track star, and he found out he had cancer, and he couldn't go to the Olympics that year, and so he just he formed this little girl's track team, and on the day he died, they won a national AAU championship. Wow. And I thought, the story just killed me, being yeah. the next codes and everything. And so, but there was no way to reach him. It didn't even say what town he was in, you know. And and, uh, and so I call, it's now one in the morning, and I call the New Mexico State Police just to say, if they would have, wondered if they had any idea, and I got that dispatcher on the line, and and I told him what I was looking at. And he said, oh, I went to high school with him. I said, here's his parents' number. You know? And yeah. so the next morning I called his parents. And they said, well, you know, every studio has offered us money on this thing and, and want us to do it. And uh, and But we would certainly consider you, I think. And then they started asking me questions. And as it turns out, this guy, who ran by then the father who was running the New Mexico convention system, he was Danny Thomas's partner, the comedian. Oh wow. And they were touring mm-hmm. back in the nineteen the late nineteen thirties or early nineteen forties, I believe. And they came to Little Rock and he and his wife decided they just had it with show business and they were gonna get out. Mm-hmm. So they dropped out in Little Rock, rented a place, found a school to go to and she went to to college at a Henderson University, a small college in uh, south of Little Rock, and uh, and then she, I said, well, that's funny, that's where my mother went. As it turns out, they knew each other, and so she oh, said, well, gosh. God says you should get this, and so they gave it to me in spite of everything. You know, I came out. Wow. I tried to. I mean, I came out. I'm all a year. It was like months later. All the studios called one day. I don't know what happened. I never figured it out. And they all wanted to make a deal on this film. So I claimed I would come out and make a deal with them. I was starving to death. The bank me lo- the bank loaned me the last money they severed ever loaned me, and I headed out here, picked the company, made a deal with, with them, and then uh, Columbia, which is now Sony, we went over to pitch it to CBS, and CBS said, well, we want to do it. But who's going to write it? And and the uh, the guys I was assigned to at Columbia said, now, don't bring up any writers or anything. We know you haven't been out here before. You don't know the business. And the guy, he kept turning, at CBS kept turning down the writers they suggested. And, and finally I raised my hand as one of the Sony guys. Oh. One of the guys was kicking me on the table. And I said, I know a guy that might write it. And the guy from CBS said, who? And I said, my friend Bill Harrison. And he did, and there was a long pause, and he said, "Do you mean William Harrison, the professor and doctor who wrote Rollerball and all those great books?" And I said, "That's him." And he said, "Let me tell you, if you can get him to write it, we have a deal." And so wow. I said, "Do you have a phone on use?" I went to the phone. I called Bill Harrison. Uh, he said, "Of course, I'll write it." <laughs> I went back in wow. and said, "We have a deal," and that's. Uh, uh, that's the shortened from, version of what had happened, and I apologize from for hum, from hum, telling that hum, story. Oh no! From humble beginnings to uh, your your wife Linda, uh, you guys uh, created Mozart Productions, and you guys right. were top of so many shows. Boy, I know. Also, well, I, met I her, liked of course it. when I got to Son- to Columbia. Yeah, and then you guys got married, and then eventually you guys created Mozart. Boy, you guys are so talented. Another underrated show that I liked was Evening Shade. I thought, and I wanted to ask you a question. Two of my friends asked questions on that. Why did that show end? Well, it was on, I believe, for six years. And the and Sony, I mean, to tell the truth, CBS had too many shows from us. And they said, mm-hmm. uh, which one? I mean, you, if we're, if we're going to do Hearts of Fire, you've got to bring one of them to a close. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and Bert was a little tired, uh, you know, and uh, worn out. And so we all we decided that's what we would do. 
Okay, good. But it was I, an exciting show, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I really was, liked it. It was a good show, and I love Burt Reynolds. Uh, God rest his soul. He's so talented, and he was so funny. And that was a great show. And obviously, the one that I wanted to talk about, Designing Women, which was uh, my mom loved, and also uh, Florence adored that show. That show didn't have. It wasn't like a, a huge hit at the start. But eventually, and I heard that it actually got canceled, but the fans were so outraged at it that they kept the show. Was that true? Absolutely. I mean, we couldn't, because everybody, Linda sold it instantly. And, and the president of CBS said, as he was walking out of the room, he said, I'll buy it. I don't even need to hear anymore. I said, turn back. And he said, what are you going to call it? And she couldn't think fast enough. She had several titles, but she finally said, oh, design, the, designing women. And he said, perfect. <laughs> Go do the show. Mm -hmm. So we did the show. Presidents changed at CBS. Bud Grant uh, replaced the guy that was there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so we did the show, and it aired about six or seven episodes aired at the beginning of the season, and, and uh, Bud Grant called, and he said, listen, uh, the show's not going to work after the 13th. We're going to cancel it. And so there wasn't an internet or anything, so I, we sort of tried to create one on our own. And then a, a group called Voters for Quality TV called, and they said, we love the show, and we hear it's about to get canceled. We read, and so how can we help? I mean, can we write letters? And they, and they said, this is what we're experts at. And I said, oh, of course you can write letters. <laughs> so they started writing letters, and I asked them, I said, what is a good number of letters for the network to get to show interest in the show? And they said, if they get over 4,000 letters, they get scared, and they want to put the show on. So... It was a time when Linda's mother had uh, contracted, con I mean, had gotten AIDS through a blood transfusion. And mm -hmm. so Linda was back in Missouri, waiting, taking care of her mother and, and, and trying to write from there. And the high school football coach would get on the plane every Sunday night, fly to Los Angeles and drive it to the studio. And, and I'd be there waiting on her about six in the morning and, and we would put the script and have it tight. But so, but, and so we put together a war room that was just people there constantly calling, getting people to write letters. Mm -hmm. And they also told us one other little trick that nobody knew at the time. Said, look, don't just write the letter to CBS. Write it to the president of CBS, Bud Grant. Mm -hmm. That way he has to read every letter, or somebody does. So we did it, and they had, uh, the, at the end of the first week, the mail service put on a special truck to make a run with just the big bag of mail for Bud Grant. And then one of his secretaries called really, really mad and said, you know, you're killing us. We have to open every one of these letters because they've got his name on it. They probably don't do that now. And so, yeah. well, so we can't help it. We want to show them. That's how many people by the, and within a couple of weeks, they had over 40,000 letters, which sort of mm -hmm. topped their 4,000 letters. And oh, Bud Grant was damn. mad at me. He said, they're having to run special trucks. We've had to add three people. And it's just <laughs> bags and bags of mail sitting in our office. And I said, Bud, put the show back on. That shows how many people love it. And he hung up on me. <laughs> oh, boy. I just, the next, uh, we went back to rehearsal the next week. And we were I had all the casters on the stage rehearsing. And, and um, AD came to me and said, hey, Bud Grant's on the studio phone for you, you know. And so I went over and I talked to it. And he said, Harry, I want you to get those women. There's a limo waiting outside. I want you to get those women, get them in the car, and head over here right now. Wow. And, and the driver knows what to do. And so I told the women, and they all got in the car, and I did too, and we headed over the hill to uh, CBS. And, and the driver pulled up in front of a, the building, which is a big flagpole there and so forth. And uh, he told, said, Mr. Grant, wants you to just get out and stand beside the car. You don't have, don't say a thing, you know. And so we did. And then a little bit, Bud Grant and two of his lieutenants came out. And he was carrying something in his arm, but I couldn't tell what it was. He walks to the flagpole. He unveils a big white flag, and he runs it up the flagpost and walks back. Oh, in that is funny. Oh, <laughs> my know. God, what a great story. That and he never cool. said a word. <laughs> And, but when I went back to the office, they had renewed the show, and uh, they left word while we were gone, of course. And so, and that's that's what happened. And, and then it's it amazing because it was top rated. Oh, it's huge. yeah, it was huge. And then what's amazing, and you know more than anyone, is that a lot of the top shows were not well liked by some of the execs.
the big way. I remember Hill Street Blues. I was watching a thing where they wanted to cancel it after their first year. And, and I forget who was the head of it, but Steve Bochco said, yeah, when we had a meeting, the head of it, I forget who was at the time, he is angry and he goes, we can't cancel it now. And he goes, why? He goes, we have too many Emmys. <laughs> you know, we've been nominated for too many Emmys. I remember so, that. Uh, yeah, so they, so they got, it's just funny how many mistakes they made. Now, obviously one of your great friends, and I'm a huge political person, is Bill Clinton. And I've read so much about you guys. And you were the, I think you're one of the keys, if not the key to get him into office. It seemed like whatever he was in trouble. You were kind of that voice that came out and helped him. When did did you meet him at, in college or just when you were in Arkansas when he was running for governor? No, what was that was, relationship it, about? It was when I first, I'm a little older than he is, and it was when I first, I was coaching in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. My brother, who was teaching biology in Hot Springs, you know, which was 35 miles away, Mm -hmm. And uh, and then he became a doctor and retired in Little Rock. But he called me. It was around Thanksgiving, and he said, listen, I'm going to bring this guy over, and I want you to have the night before Thanksgiving dinner with us. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. what's his name? He said, it's a guy, Bill Clinton, we meet at Shoney's every night around midnight and just talk through what happened that day. He's just getting ready to go off to college, uh, to Oxford, you know, and uh why do, why do you want me to meet him so bad? He said, because he's going to be president someday. And so I said, wow. you are running around with a guy that's telling you he's going to be president <laughs> someday. Do you want to bring him over here? And he said, yep. no, he's never said a word, but he's going to be president someday. So my brother brought wow. him to the, and we went out for Thanksgiving. And, uh, and then when he got back to Hot Springs, he called and said, what do you think? And I said, he's going to be president someday. And so that was it. Mm. And then obviously, good. I remember while the hunting of the president, I believe it was, right. and just just a fascinating documentary about all the scandals that people were trying to lay on him. And now we're kind of seeing in the climate of today just how dirty, because I think politicians, we've always known there's a little bit of no craziness between the Democrats and Republicans against each other, but now it's out in the open. And it's just so insane. Why don't you talk about some of the younger listeners, the climate during that time, during the attacks and some of the things. And obviously, Biden, he's no angel. We're not here, here no, saying any not. lies. But just the climate. He had a good heart and he wanted to do the right things. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and so uh, we were always uh, we were always willing to help. Mm -hmm. And but to see the kind of things that the Republicans were doing at that time. And, and here's the thing. I did the debate. I worked on the debate team, too. And, mm -hmm. and so every place we'd go to have a debate, we would have dinner with the Republican guys. And, and we even, between the Republicans and myself and a couple more on our side, we even, we even put together a little trick for another presidential candidate that was running. And that was funny. And But we all laughed, and, and we loved each other, though we knew we were on sides. And, and uh, that's what upsets me now, that no, I mean, I'm afraid this bridge can't be healed, but I, I, I certainly hope it can. But yeah. uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the guy with the right temperament to come in, you know. Mm -hmm. The Constitution was not made for people who were not normal people in some sense, you know, it, mm -hmm. because it was never thought of and that somebody's going to come in and try to do this and try to do that. And so it, it's been, it's been difficult. It's been difficult, you know, just watching it. And we still, we still do a few things for a few of the political candidates whenever mm -hmm. we can. And we just, I just want it back to where it used to be. And we all just argued about it, but we weren't going to bring down the country. I mean, by this kind of just sheer hatred between the two groups. Yeah. It's, I, I think that's what's sad about today is that there's so much division. You could have, you know, agree to disagree. And I, I've been in business and I always say it's not a great deal unless both sides gave up something. And we have a Correct. deal now where no one wants to give up anything. And right. if you do, the constituents, 
then say you're a sellout, you're you're a flake, and it just it's it's just gotten so nasty that because I think politics are fascinating. I I've, I've studied it. I I just on my own. I just think I just watched the Nixon uh, Kennedy the debates for fun. So that's what kind of a political mm -hmm. file I am. But it's it's just fascinating, and I think that fascination kind of gone to just dysfunction. Oh, and, absolutely. When yeah. I started in Little Rock, I did a lot of political films there, you know, for candidates. Uh, and uh, uh, but but it's just it's just not the same now. I mean, it was it was just a whole different era in some way. We've got to figure out how to get back into that middle somehow. Yeah. Both sides, you know. Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully, listening to your stories will do it. Uh, so let's go on to your website, which I have been on uh, for the last listening to very many great stories. And your website is the story you've never you never heard dot com. The story you never heard dot com. We're going to be sharing uh, tomorrow morning. We'll give you all sites and the links. But what made you want to start this website? And talk about some of the things that you are, because you were a history teacher when you were young. And why don't you talk about why you did create this website? You know, I think it goes back to my grandfather's. One of them never read anything except Zane Gray book. The other one never <laughs> well, read pretty... any... right. The other one never read anything but classic book. But when myself and my brother and our other cousins, we would spend the night at uh, one of their houses, and we'd sleep on pallets in front of a fireplace with a fire going, and our grandfathers would come in and stay up to well after midnight telling us stories. And a lot of them were the stories that I've redone here after research and so forth. And so it was just such a good feeling and such a, gosh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating though. It just made, it made you feel good. And so I, then I became a history teacher and, uh, and then I, you know, I just thought it would be good to get that feeling back out there. And it was because a lot of what's going on now, you know, and so I just thought, well, maybe people can get together and just listen to a piece of history they didn't know about. Almost none of them are political. I mean, unless they're political from a long time ago and you don't yeah. recognize either party. I mean, you do, but you don't think about it. But, And I just thought, okay, maybe this will help reduce the tension. Yeah. And so it's been sort of fun. We've got about 50 out there. It's completely free to listen to these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and you just have to go to the story you never dot com. Most of the major platforms will carry it. And... Uh, and so it was just a place to tell stories that nobody have ever heard. You know, I mean, everybody thinks the Titanic was the biggest shipwreck concerning the United States, but that wasn't it. It was the yeah. Sultana. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew anything about the Sultana because on the day the Sultana sank on the Mississippi River, about nine miles upstream between Tennessee and Arkansas there, that was the day John Wilkes Booth was run to ground and killed. And so... Mm. The Sultana disaster, which killed over 1,800, and no telling how many more, they just don't know. It got three lines in the New York Times. It got nothing in all, <laughs> almost every other newspaper in America because of the John Wilkes Booth thing. So, and, and there are a lot of stories like that, just things you didn't know. I remember I brought up the, and we were talking about a pre-show, pre uh, the Great Boston Molasses Flood of 1919, and uh, right. friends had, and people online had emailed me and said their grandparents literally would smell, they lived near then, they'd smell sweetness, you know, for decades later oh, when absolutely. they would go down there. It was just an amazing, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, the great, uh, about the that one Flood, particular yeah. incident. Well, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, molasses were stored in vats like when you go by an oil refiner and you see those giant vats. I mean, what you saw in uh, New York in that era was uh, giant wooden vats just like that, that massive, and they were filled with molasses uh, because so much molasses was used in so many products and most of it in New York, manufacturing in New York. And uh, when I burst, burst some others, and there were five or six feet of molasses coming down the street. I mean, and it wiped out houses. It it uh, destroyed businesses. It killed everybody. I mean, a lot of people. And uh, it was just, uh, it was fascinating. And, and for some reason, it was just sort of lost to history. Nobody's ever 
I've known much about it, but we give you great detail in the story that you. you yeah. Know. Also, if you want a, another place, obviously for your stories is that uh, is Brother D- Southern Tales and Hollywood Adventures, and that is a book that you and the, the reviews are epic. <laughs> he doesn't have one review under four. I mean, that's amazing. This and all of the reviews, the right most reviews are just great book. I like it. These are some very detailed, reviews and they love this book. Why did you talk about the book and some of the things that you have in it? Well, it was just a, uh, it, it, it's just mainly a book about growing up in a very small town in South Arkansas and how life was then, which it was much different. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't see how kids survive today, but but I know they need more guidance and they say it on more. But our mothers released us in the mornings when school wasn't going on. And if they didn't see us again at 6 o'clock that night, that was okay. That was what they expected. Now, I don't think they were bad mothers because they loved us more than any kids were loved. But but mm-hmm. I talk about things like when I was five or, or five or six, and my the kid that lived next door, was he was eight. And, you know, and, and these killings started in Texarkana, which is on the Arkansas-Texas border, of course. Mm-hmm. And some people got killed, uh, a couple of them. And then a week or two later, several other people got killed. And then it just kept going, you know. And about once a month, there was a violent murder on either the Arkansas or the Texas side. And um, and the Texas Rangers were sent in and set up a station. And nobody in all the newspapers around the country, it was one of Walter Cronkite's first jobs to come there for radio and mm. so forth. And so it was covered nationally just like everything is now, and, and about this killer. And they never caught the killer. And the kid that lived next door to me, Charlie, he he kept thinking, he's going to be here long. We're not that far away. He's going to kill us. Said, and our dads were both sleeping with shotguns in their house, as was everybody else in my hometown. The movie theaters had all closed. They, I mean, they closed around 8 o'clock because they didn't want anybody having to walk or be out after dark. And, and and nobody realized. And then several years later, somebody said, well, this this guy was a serial killer. And that was the first time the term had been used. And so that's how the term serial killer came to be, you know, I mean, from mm-hmm. scaring all those little kids. The guy yeah. next to me I mean, that did live next door to me was named Charles B. Pierce. And uh, he went on to make his first movie was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And it did. Oh, great. yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And so then I was in, he was in Texas and I was in Little Rock. And he, one day my phone rang and, and I picked it up. And this voice just said, the town that dreaded sundown. And I mm. said, it's perfect title for the movie you're about to do. Do it. Because I didn't even know it was doing it. But he did a movie called The Town That Dreaded Sundown that got a lot of acclaim that was about that period, too. So mm-hmm. it, was, well, it was interesting. So, so a lot of books is pretty much tales that you had, again, growing up and some things. What are, what are some, what is, name a favorite one that you like. Oh, I like the one about Patty. The town drunk. Mm. You know, we were, it was sort of unusual. It was sort of a benevolent town. And there was this guy named Patty. And every day, my my parents owned the grocery store and my brother, we would be there a lot. And it was on the main sidewalk going to town. And, and Patty would come walking down the thing every morning. And we'd see him lots of mornings. He would be perfectly sober. And then we, we would be there when they were getting ready to close the store or something, and Patty would be walking back home, <laughs> and he would be totally drunk. You know, he couldn't walk. <laughs> and he would always tip his hat to us. He was a mm. good Irishman, I suppose. And, you know, <laughs> and so it was getting near Christmas, and my brother said, I, I think we ought to give Patty a present. He probably doesn't have anybody else to give him a present. And so we told my mother, and she got all excited, and she had some socks. She said, well, I had some socks I was going to give as a gift to you guys along with the other stuff, but why don't I wrap them, and you guys give Patty the socks. And so she wrapped them, and we were waiting out. You know, as the sun was going down that day, and Patty comes walking drunk down the sidewalk. We give him the socks, and Patty says, uh, he just looks at it and opens it, and then he sees their socks, and he just said, somebody loves old Patty. Somebody loves old Patty. I mean, it about killed mm-hmm. us and he teared up 
and he said he thanked us so much, and then he walked on, and that was the last we'd ever thought we'd hear about. But the next day, or a few days later, we were out there, and he was walking home from town, and you know it was Christmas Eve, and he was seemed to be totally sober, and he had this big white box, and he gave it to us, and and he said, "Open this," and I, we opened it, and it was all. It was a probably fifty to a hundred two inch firecrackers and fireworks wow. and so forth. And he says, "I didn't need the money for drinking anymore, and I want to give you this." And, and oh. then he walked off saying, "Somebody loves dear old Patty." Well, he got a job after he sobered up. He got a job at the county courthouse as just a janitor to try to keep himself together. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, as the years passed on in the sixties, he became the head maintenance person for the Calhoun County Courthouse, which is on the wow. historic register in Gorda. And he had a good career, and he had a staff under him. And, you know, and then he was awarded, and the governor came, and everybody came some years later. I wasn't able to go, but my brother was. Wow. And, and they gave him uh, an award for just being a good wow. person, a well-known person. And so that one always got to me. And but, Yeah, one. Want- one act of kindness can really do for people. And not that that was the key, but it kind of when we all, because the minute I think you start thinking you're better than one is the minute you lose all compassion for them. And I think if you, oh, if we all just kind of respect, yeah, if we people and we, we kind of are compassionate, we all need that, that uh, pick me up when we're having a problem or when we're down in our luck or, uh, and I think we need to get back to that old type of uh, yes, that type do. of thinking where we're all in this together. And I think that would, it makes everything a lot happier. Uh, uh, now, well, and especially right now, we are all in it together. And so we should just yep. decide we're in it together and you might be on a different boat, but we're all, we're all in the ocean here and we need to get it together. Yeah, definitely. With, uh, with, the, especially with this virus, I'm in the field. Just, uh, you just kind and you know of, what? I'm uh, not numbers. sure Patty quit drinking because of us. All I know is that the next day he wasn't drunk. And several times after that, we yep. told me, look, he never had a drink. And so I'm, I'm, I hope it was, I hope we helped. I just hope we helped. It definitely, it, uh, I'm sure it did. And this book, again, Florence and I are going to enjoy reading it. I think the stories are amazing. Uh, we're going to give all the websites, all the Twitter links in the morning. We're going to make sure that everyone follows you. Uh, RoadsideAmerica.com is another website for people. Uh, if you're traveling, if you like to go places, it's a site that you guys could go on too, that has different things, different attractions, kind of not the kind of the, the out of the way type things too, which I liked. I've, right. I've checked and, it you know, out. We made a deal with them within the last couple mm-hmm. of days. So yeah. So you guys are going to be affiliated. With, we're putting yeah. information about them on our side. Yeah. So, and remember the retweets are very big. Uh, the more retweets that you do, the more, more sites that can be set pro people that we that we uh, really believe in and also sites that are really well done and this site is fun it's well done it gives you a lot of stuff to do because let's face it when traveling comes back uh when all this virus stuff ends people are going to be traveling like mad i think so go to the places that are out of the way enjoy your family and enjoy some Quite of right. the great things in history and this is what i, I wanted to ask you lastly the thing that cracks me up about history is that a lot of our history books are wrong about some of the the things that uh, like with uh i remember i was reading uh paul revere and you think wow paul revere is the only guy and he he did the less riding than anyone else in the ride yeah it was uh i think william dawes and samuel prescott i think were the guys that rode and one of them well and then uh, a month later there was the young 14 year old girl that rode further than yeah. a lot and, and you know and carried a a stick with her to beat off because uh Hoodlums would try to attack her on her horse because it was three in the morning and she was going down there and she would beat them off with it. And she was very successful. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Paul Revere was lucky. His name rhymed. Yep. With, like the poet and he did too. And, William... uh, and, but our stories, the one thing about them, they're not very long. They'll be eight, yeah. 12 minutes long. And so if you're out jogging, you can, jogging, you can listen to one and you don't have to come back and read the next chapter. 
you've heard everything that happened in that story. So uh, we kept them short for that reason. And I think what I liked about it is that I could do, I have my headphones on, I'm doing a little bit of other work. I'm doing ports or respiratory sleep reports, whatever. And then I could listen to it and it's really pleasant. The stories are easy going, got a Southern flow to it, which is always very, very appealing and they're funny. And some of the stories are very, they'll make you, make you think and will make you feel really good. So I think all his, I, I think Harry Sites, he's done a great job. And I frankly am Harry, I hope he doesn't get offended, but I, I just don't like TV of today. I think it's pretty much just reality shows and game shows. And I just oh my can't God. handle it. The I network just can't has fallen on to bad, to bad times, Jim. They just have. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm not most designing women, as somebody reminded me the other day, said most designing women shows you couldn't even do today. Because yeah. they were about something. And now it seems if a show, we did shows about AIDS, about uh, prejudice, about, uh, what well, well, you name it. And today, mm -hmm. if you do something like that, the network, don't, they don't want you to run it. It might offend somebody. No, it's okay. We've got to pick the right people to offend, but it's okay yeah. to offend people because it makes them think. Yeah, look at, I mean, look at uh, Carol O'Connor and look at some of the greatest shows of MASH even, some of the greatest shows of all time. And they make you think. You may not agree with everything, but it also makes you kind of internalize it and say, wow, you think about your own actions and you and the way that you that uh, we are as well. But yeah, TV. I like to think when I watch TV or feel good. And I, you know, the Waltons, Little House in the Prairie, and you know, Bill Bixby, and some of the great great writers of the past. I mean, they made you feel something. Well, Michael right. Landon, and I don't feel anything other than extreme boredom. <laughs> and, uh, right, and and most network shows, and it drives me crazy, and, and for all of them that are listening to your podcast, the executives, I'm sure you'll never have a cent again, but, uh, <laughs> but even the, the, the cadence of delivering the speech is so wrong. Mm -hmm. So the minute you turn on the show and they have that little sing-song cadence in their voices, you know this is not a real show, this is not real, these are not about real people. And so you're you're dead from the start. Well, I, uh, the, the one thing you haven't mentioned was uh, designing women to play starts mm. April the twenty, April the fourteenth. Right now mm -hmm. at a place called Theater Squared in Fayetteville, Arkansas. But the New York wow. Times just named it one of the ten best theaters in the, in the U.S. last wow. week, and the, so did the Wall Street Journal. And so we're looking forward to that. And it's about the time we're in, to tell the truth. Linda's writing mm -hmm. it now. She wrote the first act, I mean the first half, but she couldn't write the second half until after the election. And she's still having trouble because she's trying to see how everything's going to smooth out. out. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're excited about that. And, and we're, we'll continue on to Broadway. Oh, but, that's fantastic. Uh, so. We'll definitely promote that as well because, like I said, so much going on, but it's great that you guys are keeping the fight going. You're keeping television, good entertainment, good fun, because it's okay to watch TV and lose yourself into something that carrying cancer but you also want good writing and you want good actors you want good stories yeah. and, and fun things and that's what i miss i watch old tv because of the great right. you know the well, great it's writing. better designing mm -hmm. women is it, it's almost as popular now as it ever was because it's on so many it's on at least three platforms now and there's not a day mm -hmm. goes by that we don't get email address to designing women you know and it's from yeah. a much younger generation it's from uh mid to 20 year old mm -hmm. so young people are encouraging because a lot of them are getting into the old books old tv shows old things because i do think they really want good things and i think they realize that they're kind of being being almost talked down to with some of the silly shows that that are oh my God. going on yeah. right now yeah and i think that's a good thing but it's going to be sharing the story you never um and th they have a link that uh if you if you click Listen now. You could subscribe to it. They are on Anchor uh, FM, and it's a, Anchor is a site we almost use. They're a great site, so they have a lot of things. It's very well done. You could listen to it on S Spotify. It has a support page as well. The stories are fun. They're uh, some are very educational, and 
telling you, we know so little about the history because so much has happened in our country and it just fascinates me. And I know it'll fascinate you too. Harry, we would love to have you on again because I know Florence would adore talking to you. She was such a huge, all your shows she really liked, especially Designing Women. She was a huge, and we would love to have you on again. It's maybe maybe later when we could talk more about uh, the Designing Women play. That would be kind okay. of fun. Uh, James, we're willing, and, and tell Florence I'm sorry I missed her. Oh, sure. And we're so great. Thank you for coming on. We're so gracious that you would come on. Uh, we are such a big fans of the work, and to have someone so talented, it's just really a pleasure. Thank you so much, and we can't wait to talk to you again. Okay. All right. Well, have, have a good week. And stay safe. You too. Take care. Okay.